Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a returning subscriber, hello, friend. Good to see you today. Hope welcome. you have an amazing day. Really what, hope you have an amazing day. <laughs> you see what happens on the Ethics Experts when you subscribe? You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So hit that subscribe button. We are here today with the one, the only, compliance evangelist, Tom Fox. How are you doing, Tom? Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, super excited to get you on to talk about your new book, um, the update to your book, the Compliance Handbook. Uh, you're somebody who uh, anybody in the compliance game uh, should know. If they're not, they need to wake up from their uh, Rip Van, Van Winkle sleep and uh, get to know you because you are really, um, you know, you take that that title seriously of being the compliance evangelist. You put out so much content, so much uh, actionable information for folks to really elevate the profession. Uh, you, you know, people throw that term thought leader around a lot. You're somebody who's actually, uh, earned it and lived that out. So, um, really excited, learned so much from you, really excited to get you on to kind of pick your brain about this, this newest endeavor, this newest labor of love that you, uh, you've been working on for the, for the past, uh, past few months. Great. Looking forward to it. Thanks. So why don't we just dive in, Tom? Why don't you talk to us a little bit about the book itself uh, for those who haven't heard of it or who haven't pur purchased it? What was the motivation behind, um, you know, writing it? Sure. So the original Compliance Handbook, I uh, finished it up in uh, December of 2017. It was uh, published in uh, May of 2018. Since that time, there have been some, uh, some very significant developments for the compliance practitioner, we had the uh, 20, uh, excuse me, the 2019 evaluation of corporate compliance documents or corporate compliance programs released by the Department of Justice. We had in June of 2019, OFAC released its compliance framework. In July of 2019, uh, we had the, uh, or excuse me, of 2018, we had the uh, evaluation of corporate compliance programs from the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. And then in June of 2020, we had the Department of Justice's update to the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. So we had four documents about what constitutes a best practices compliance program with a little bit different focus in each. So we needed to update, or I needed to update the uh, handbook based around this new information. 20 20 was the number one year for FCPA enforcement actions yep. with uh, some very, very large cases. So I needed to incorporate that. There'd been a uh, pretty big shift over uh, from 2017 uh, to 2020 around not simply uh, the use of data or data in compliance programs, but the use of data by the compliance professional. And so that needed to be uh, updated, I thought, as well. And then other developments, uh, both in terms of enforcement actions, the international scope of compliance and international uh, anti-corruption enforcement actions, uh, as well as uh, just new commentary that I needed to, uh, to put out. So uh, I wrote it uh, last year and uh, have a thrill to be published by LexisNexis, who is the legal, leading publisher of legal treatises, and they wanted to open a compliance a part of their library. So they uh, invited me to uh, become their first author uh, with a compliance perspective. And uh, so this book is being published by LexisNexis and uh, I'm gonna update it every year uh, going forward with through my relationship with LexisNexis. So uh, hopefully it will be out uh, by the end of uh, this month, the end of June, 2021. And uh, hopefully the compliance professionals will find it useful. That's great, Tom. I'm not sure whether I should uh, congratulate you on getting published by LexisNexis or congratulate them on getting you <laughs> onto their platform. It's a big win for LexisNexis. And it's cool that you're going to be updating this annually um, because as you were going through all of that, I was like, well, it just feels like this profession of compliance, the pace of change is accelerating. Right. There are more you know, organizations and regulatory agencies speaking into it. There's more dynamism that is being expected of companies on this front of compliance and ethics. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, keep getting those annual updates. Do you feel like it's accelerating, Tom? Do you well, feel like uh, the pace of change good. is coming faster? Well, I can just really stick with you guys, Gio, and, and think <laughs> about the changes really since you guys have, have come in uh, full force in, I think, 2019. 
and the changes, not only in compliance line, but the changes your clients have expected, yeah. uh, the, the changes the regulators have talked about, the trends you guys saw in the 2021 benchmark report you recently released, and the, the use of data, data analytics uh, has really driven the compliance profession uh, much faster during the pandemic than probably any other thing. And now we're talking about ESG. Right. So uh, the, the dynamism of change seems to be the only constant. Yeah. And your update, um, you know, sometimes these people put out new additions and there's really like, they just changed the foreword to your point, like over the last few, few years, you, you listed off a handful of these new pronouncements, these new, um, pieces of guidance that these different regulatory bodies and agencies have put out to your point around that rate of change, how much, uh, updating did, did, did this, um, did this addition have relative to the original, uh, the original piece? This edition had about 40, 45% new material in it. Wow. Uh, and it was really driven by those three documents released uh, in 2019. And then the update uh, released in 2020, they put a whole, not a whole new spin, but you could see how the DOJ was refocusing uh, their uh, efforts. And I mean, if I could really point to one overall, uh, I guess three overall themes. One is I talked about data yep. and in the, 2020 update, the Department of Justice made it clear that the compliance profession must have access to all data lakes within a company. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, they have to explain why. Two, uh, they move from the risk assessment, which is the foundation of every compliance program being done every two or three years, to an almost uh, continuous risk assessment process, or at the very least, when your uh, business or risk change, you need yeah. to reassess your risk. And last year, everyone's risk changed right. because we were all in a pandemic lockdown. And now we're coming back to the office. So our risks have changed again. But then they connected your risk assessment to two concepts I don't think many people had really thought about before, which is continuous monitoring and continuous improvement. So that your risk assessment informs the changes that you may need to make. And then from there, you continually monitor those changes and use the information or the data generated by that monitoring to update your compliance program. So I almost see it as a straight line now from risk assessment to continuous monitoring right. to continuous improvement. And then the third thing that was uh, really didn't change, but once again, a re-emphasis by the Department of Justice was in the 2020 update, the compliance profession, compliance and ethics, I think uh, is seen as in many ways, the heart of a company's culture. Yeah. Uh, and leading that discussion, well, the DOJ made clear they expect compliance to, to lead the discussion for institutional fairness and institutional justice. And, and once again, that's not a new concept, but it's something, uh, a, a re-emphasis by the DOJ. And that's what leads me to, to now articulate over the past couple of months that compliance needs to lead the ESG discussion. 100%. They need to lead the ESG effort. Right. And we, we and, and I say you and I, uh, and the three of us need to, to lead that effort, each from our different perspectives. You guys as a product and service provider and myself as a as a commentator, we need to make sure compliance is uh, leading the effort. And then we need to give uh, our customer base, uh, the compliance professionals, those tools to really uh, continue to build an ESG structure, uh, policies and procedures, and then report on that to now multiple stakeholders, not simply the shareholders. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because a lot of those things that you brought up, if we kind of step, you know, step out of the functional continuous monitoring and stuff like that, those issues of culture and justice and fairness, they've kind of always been within the realm of influence of compliance, but at times they've been a jump ball based right. on, you know, the culture of the company or their org structure or whatever it is. And with some of these developments, I think a lot of them are, uh, you know, they're predictable or they're natural developments. Right but the DOJ or whoever it is is kind of giving the ball to compliance and saying, all right, well, you all need to make sure this happens. Other people care about it and you can collaborate, but also you're kind of on the hook for it. Um, and I, I imagine we're going to see that develop over totally. the next several years in this ESG discussion. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and probably a little bit before you guys really uh, came onto the scene with compliance line, the hotline was really seen as just a tool to help uh, 
either detect or prevent wrongdoing. Right. And if you didn't have any hotline calls, well, you must be in compliance. Well, those notions, I think, are, have now been, been disabused. But I think properly seen, the hotline is a way to create an entire culture of speak up. Right. A hotline can be one tool, one part of your speak up. But you not only have to allow people to have a safe place to speak up, you have to listen to them. Yeah. Whether that listening is uh, their immediate supervisor, whether it's a manager, whether it's a CCO or a or, uh, person uh, who receives the hotline information, yeah. and then you have to action that information. Uh, you have to investigate if appropriate, you have to counsel if appropriate, you may have to remediate it if appropriate. But it's that entire movement from, well, we've got a, a hotline that people can report legal wrongdoing to. This is the basis of how we create a speak up culture in our organization that um, allows people a safe place to speak up, allows someone to hear it, and more importantly, someone to listen to it, and then someone to do someone that, right. something with that information. Yeah, and to your point, communicate that back to folks so that they see that when they stepped out on that ledge to raise their hand and speak up about something, that the company actually cares about it and they're doing something about it, and they can see those changes happen in policies or someone moving to a different position or some kind of training or something, right? Um, it's just such an opportunity as we get into this compliance 3.0 for us to really kind of lever up the crowdsourcing of risk management in our organizations. And to your point, if that, if, uh, that hotline or these other tools, whatever we have in place or have put in place, um, to help us man manage risks, um, if we can use those things a little bit differently and help drive some different behaviors, we can really start to create massive leverage within our organization from a risk mitigation standpoint. And, and so, Nick, you, you said something there that I want to pick up on because you guys are not lawyers. You didn't start out in the compliance profession. You bring a different set of eyes and different set of ears, a different set of experiences to compliance. Yeah. And you just mentioned crowdsourcing. Well, five years ago, if you'd said, well, we're going to crowdsource our compliance program, I don't think you'd have been laughed out of the room. People would have said, WTF, yeah. what are you talking about? Uh, this is written by lawyers for lawyers, and we'll tell you what to do. Right. And then we'll tell you how to respond. And the thing that you guys continually talk about is unleashing the potential of your employees. Well, if you can evolve your compliance program to a speak up culture and with institutional justice and institutional fairness, you essentially can crowdsource your company's culture so that the frontline employees are coming up with the ideas yep. to sell better, sell more efficiently and create greater ROI all while doing business ethically and in compliance. You got it. Yeah. That was said beautifully. Yeah, it was great. I mean, that's the dream, right? And to, you know, draw an exaggeration for distinction, you know, there's one type of approach to build a straw man where compliance is just the lawyers and the executives making sure that they're covering each other's backs. And what we're talking about, whether, you know, you using crowdsourcing, taking, you know, taking care of that fairness and that justice is compliance is for the entire company, right. for all employees. Compliance is culture. And I think specifically with, within the hotline, there are angles on this in your policies and your training and all of that. But the hotline has this really big opportunity to transform the usefulness of it right. from a – it's a comment box that some people you know, say when these really massive things right. come up and hopefully they tell us before the journalist, turn it into your, you know, your direct line – to using all the humans in your organizations right. as sensors. That's right. And those sensors are not going to just be letting you know when there's a massive fire and everything's <laughs> burning down, but they're going to be giving you hints and they're going to be giving you indications and they're going to be giving you ideas. And this concept of a hotline, which you should integrate with your web form and your intelligent app and whatever it is, can be your way to use your humans throughout your organizations as sensors and not just be doing that continuous monitoring from a, I'm monitoring my emails and, you know, my security and things like that. But I'm, my whole team is monitoring how we're ethically going about this business. Yeah. And Tom said something interesting, which I think dovetails perfectly into what you just said, that ESG only makes sense for compliance to handle and to spearhead because it's this culture piece, because it's the circulatory system of the organization, because it's meant to coach the different departments and the different um, groups within the company that have those different challenges and different dynamics and pressures and stuff, um, stuff like, like that. And you had said an analogy last week when we were talking about ESG that it's, you know, to the extent that an organization is about to go out and get an ESG person when they already have a compliance team in place, 
it's kind of akin to you running a bakery and you have, <laughs> you're already making dinner rolls and you're making bread and you're making cookies and uh, croissants. And uh, the boss says, you know, we need to get a pastry chef in here <laughs> to cook. The, it's like, well, I'm already doing, I'm already baking all of this stuff. I can right. also bake this thing. It's already, I already have all the ingredients for it and so forth. Yeah. And compliance has this unique position or this unique ability or skill set to translate uh, vague um, or, you know, legal written regulations into actionable steps for the sales folks, for the production folks and so forth. And the ESG initiative broadly is at a sort of a more nascent stage of that broader process in general. So I love that you said that, Tom. What, how much time did you spend on the book on ESG and where do you think, you know, five, five, five years from now, if you compared the, you know, the set, you know, sixth edition of your book to this edition, where do you think you'll see more overweight for like ESG type discussions and how that kind of begins to really grow together or get grafted onto the compliance vine? So my final chapter of the book, the, the it's very biblical. I have 12 chapters and um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the 12th chapter is, is really looking down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's where I focused uh, uh, my comments around ESG. But where I see us, you know, five or even 10 years down the road as uh, ESG, uh, because let me, let me just back up and pick up something you said, Gio, which is that you want the hotline report to come in and the way you phrased it, so they don't call a journalist. And I was really intrigued by that. You didn't say, don't call the regulators. You didn't say, don't call the Department of Justice. Yep. You are, I think, cor correctly articulated, your base risk is reputational risk. Yep, yep. And uh, whatever you may pay in an investigation, wherever you may pay in a fine, will pale besides yep. the hit your stock price takes. Yep. If you're a public company. So that risk is the biggest risk. And I think you correctly identified that's the reason you have to have these sensors in place. Because if the, you're consuming public or even the greater public gets wind of something on social media, uh, your stock could, could literally go down 20% in one day. Yep. It may come back up, but for that day, it's, it's pretty tough for anybody right. who has to sell. So um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why we can use the tools, starting with the hotline, moving to a speak up culture, moving to a culture that takes the information the sensors bring and crowdsource that into greater business efficiency with compliance leading that effort in ESG. And ESG, uh, so uh, I come from Houston. Last week was a huge, huge week for the energy industry uh, with uh, the two events. Uh, the first was uh, the Exxon shareholder essentially revolt by uh, voting in two, perhaps three board members who are uh, going to see carbon neutrality from Exxon, uh, you have to listen to your shareholders. Yeah, right. And to think about that, to, to, to actually vote down a board's uh, ballot, for uh, board of directors ballots for new board members, you have to have some very upset investors because yeah, exactly. that's typically not something investors do. And this is a long-term play by the investors and Exxon refused to listen to them. And they got spanked and they got spanked very publicly and, and humiliatingly uh, as well. So you have to listen. And that's what ESG and that's why compliance is so critical because in compliance, we're about transparency. Mm -hmm. We're about uh, documenting or in my case, document, document, document. And then uh, being able to show that documentation to a regulator, to a shareholder, to a stakeholder uh, or to an employee. Right. to demonstrate that uh, you're not only in compliance, but you're acting in good faith and you're really moving the ball forward. So uh, when you couple that with the data that uh, really uh, accelerated with data analytics, I think compliance is uniquely su suited to be able to look at that data from a very macro view yep. to see big trends, to see anomalies and step in and correct something before as a journalist finds out about it or a regulator finds out about it. Yeah. And, you know, that, that journalist piece is just shorthand for all the other ways that people can report this, right? You know, your employees, you know, a bunch of them are going to have Twitter, a bunch of them are going to be on their Facebook, a bunch of them are going to, you know, go onto forums and can potentially talk about this. And listen, there are a lot of mistakes people can make with their hotline, with their intake. But I think one of the cardinal sins is not following up on that totally. stuff and not letting employees know that when you speak up here, we take action. And obviously you have to manage privacy and all of that stuff, but 
if employees think that nothing's going to happen, then they're, they're not going to speak up. If you can get engaged in, uh, you know, you can get employees engaged in the, in the cycle of you spoke, we listened, we took action, everyone's better off. Then you start building that culture, that fairness, that justice that we're all going after. Um, but, you know, it's going to come from all angles, right? Tom, to your point, you know, we were increasingly talking about how all of your stakeholders matter, right? Your customers, your suppliers, not just your shareholders. But, you know, <laughs> to your point, Tom, your shareholders can revolt yeah. and they can drive a direct change at your governance level uh, to go in a new direction. And part of what we're talking about, and I think this is part of this this new era as compliance kind of grows up and kind of gets to what we've been trying to get to, is not just taking action, but compliance as a role that listens and provides that data, right. provides those insights to the board and to the other stakeholders to say, hey, guys, here's what's really going on. And you can do that a bunch of different ways. Um, and I think you highlight a bunch of things in, in the book of how compliance – can live that out better, not just adjudicating a program, but being interactive, you know, up yeah. to the board and across through the whole organization. Yeah. I mean, compliance when it's working right is paying for itself 10, 15, 20 times. You know what I'm saying? Yep. In terms of the return that it's generating with respect to cost avoidance, obviously hard to sort of quantify, but in terms of reputational, you know, enhancement, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know when a war starts until like it's over and you can, f you know, trace it back to like that first shot that was fired, you know, it's like tensions are rising and then you're like, okay, the war started on this day or whatever. This Exxon thing could be sort of the equivalent in the ESG war because it could prove to be like, we may look back on this as like, wow, that was really the tipping point or the really the watershed event where this thing that was talked about sort of concept conceptually for years, you know, the rubber finally hit the road and, you know, those gears sort of, you know, matched up and uh, we're going to kind of take this, uh, you know, s a lot more seriously now. Um, it's just an interesting dynamic for, um, you know, <laughs> the investors of a energy company to revolt to the point of, you know, voting, voting against the board on becoming carbon neutral. It's a big it's a big thing. It's a yeah. very big thing. And, um, you know, I think more folks are going to start to see that this actually matters. And as wealth transfers to, you know, generations that care about this stuff more, those people are going to vote with their feet, both in terms of where they're investing and where they're spending um, those dollars. Um, Tom, you know, you stay up on this stuff really well. Uh, obviously, you put out content every single day. Um, so as all these different documents came out, um, that fed into your update, you were obviously kind of right on the crest of each of those waves as you pulled all that stuff together for this update, um, was kind of, as you went through that comprehensive view of it all, were there any surprises or any interesting things that you noticed as you were putting it all, all together that you didn't maybe notice when you, when, you know, and a, you know, a, a new guidance came out in isolation or something like that? So really, the, uh, Nick, the biggest thing was the time frame I wrote the majority of the book was a real, uh, I had a lot of time starting March 15, uh, 2020. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I started writing then. Uh, but and what I realized uh, by the summer was the trends that had been sort of percolating in 2018, 2019, they were now not trends, they were tsunami waves yeah. moving at exponential speed and the one i would point to the most is or the biggest uh, because to me it became the most obvious was data mm -hmm. when we coupled that with the june 1 2020 uh, evaluation of corporate compliance programs update from the department of justice which specifically said that compliance must have access to the data and then directed us on how to use that data it was clear that something had changed and, and I guess for me, the biggest change was the speed in which things changed during the pandemic. Uh, it wasn't so much the, the information that uh, had been percolating around, but really we had to do, we had to do things right. differently. We companies had to sell differently. They had to invest in personal protective equipment. Um, there was now government monies available and PPP loans. And uh, so things changed so quickly really because we had to. And what you guys do and what Compliance Line does was really on the forefront of that yeah. because you had to sit down and not simply you know, re-engineer your business, but you had to re-educate your customers because you now have a remote workforce. Mm -hmm. Are you reaching out to them? Uh, are, are, are they having stresses? Uh, I mean, you guys have young kids. Uh, you know, can, can you run a business? Can you do work from home when you have three under the age of five? Right. 
uh, or something like that. Or if you want to flip it to if you're care, you're the primary care provider for an elderly parent, yep. sort of all of those things. People tell me the biggest challenges they had were not working from home, but kind of get everybody getting their own space yep. to work. Right. Uh, and even my wife and I went through that a little bit. You know, she didn't want to work at the table. So we had to set her up an office yeah. uh, to work. So, you know, those sorts of things really forced us to change. And cha that change is not going, we're not reverting back. We're not, it's not going back. That's those right. changes are here to stay. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting because um, to your point about data access, um, you know, if you're, if you're captain of this big ship, you need all of that information on the bridge to make decisions, right? You can't be sending someone down to the boiler room to see what's going on with the engine. Yeah, right. And the DOJ has, you know, officially recognized that, you know, compliance needs to be on that bridge. Compliance needs to be seeing all of this stuff. Um, and I think you make a great point, Tom, that we saw during the pandemic, um, you know, listen, who knows what the next, you know, black swan event is going to be that, uh, you know, sends a bunch of cultures and compliance programs into tumult. But we're, we all recognize that, we can't just be the auditors who come do a sweep a year later and say, hey, how did that stuff go? We need to be getting real-time access. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen that in our business. We've seen the importance of those dashboards and people, right. you know, getting APIs in, you know, for all of their different systems tied together. And we do a lot of that, what we call GRC data enhancement, because it's just what it's, it's what people need to, right. you know, you can't be driving looking in the rearview mirror. And that data access is essential. And I love... Tom, how in your book, you you don't just kind of talk about the philosophy of this. You don't just talk about the regulations. You give people a bunch of really actionable yeah, things exactly. to say, hey, you know what? You don't have to wait until you have another $200,000 exactly. to spend on this. Here's something you can do. Take a step forward. Do this. It's not going to cost you a bunch, but just pay attention to this and start getting sharp on it. And I think that you are helping us as a compliance profession get into this continuous improvement That's mode. Right. Get into this thing of like, okay, I can't just do things how they've, they've been done until I see a big problem. I got to step it forward. And I love how you bring this to practicality because like you said before, Tom, you know, anybody who's in this profession needs to be contributing to it to help us all lead to this new frontier that, you know, none of, you know, None of us have, have led in this environment before. Right. And I think that you do a great job as our compliance evangelist, helping us get to that actionability and making thousands of, uh, if not millions of compliance professionals better. Because we're all compliance professionals. We are. And that really, uh, Gio, speaks to one of the things that I think is a real strength of the book, which is the structure. Yep. Because as I said, uh, there's 12 chapters and in each chapter there's 20 to 25 different topics. And uh, I take uh, one topic and then I break it down uh, with three key takeaways. So it's designed basically, uh, you can read one chapter a month, you can read one uh, uh, topic within the chapter per day, and then you're gonna get three key takeaways that are things you can do at little or no cost to enhance or upgrade your compliance program. It's really designed as a nuts and bolts book so that if you're either want starting a compliance program or you're upgrading a Fortune 500 company. Uh, this, this book really gives you the nuts and bolts with the key takeaways in addition to some of the themes we've been talking about on this podcast. Yeah, I think that last mile of uh, moving from, you know, the academic principle-based ideas of what compliance should be and actually driving down to, you know, changing the grid on our sandpaper and really starting to refine and move it forward um, is what we're going to need kind of in this next phase of the game. Because look, Absolutely. everybody's got a hotline now. Everyone knows what policies are. You know, every legit company has an HR and, you know, compliance, you know, function if it's of any sort of um, scale or size or something like that. And, you know, it's great that the book was already kind of ahead of the curve on a continuous improvement perspective. You know, in the original edition, there's so much nuts and bolts, or there's so many nuts and bolts kind of tactics to kind of implement and move forward. Carrying that into this is, is great, but... You know, as I have conversations with professionals, the broadest, um, this is a broad brush stroke, of course, but um, the biggest complaint is like they don't have the resources. They don't have what they need to get the job done to the, to the, to the extent that they believe it should be done. And uh, you know what? You're never going to have enough budget. You're never going to have enough resources. Your to-do list is always going to be long. And so the name of the game is really small, incremental, continuous improvements in your process, you know, 1% a year can turn into 37X in 1% a day can turn into like 37X or something over the year. So 
that kind of a mentality of like, okay, well, what's something I can do today to solve for outcome, to put something new in, in, into place, uh, or work with something that's in place a little bit differently to get that better result. Just the way this book was written from that nuts and bolts perspective is, to your point, very actionable and uh, um, very implementable, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate you leading us that way, Tom, because it's really, you know, something that we see across the market is, you know, we've been talking about diversity for years and we've been talking about, you know, climate change for years and we've been talking about, yeah. you know, COVID, it seems like for a decade, but it's really <laughs> kind of a year. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about this stuff a lot and there's a lot of that academic, here's how it should be. But at some point, and I think it's on us as compliance and ethics professionals, that rubber needs to meet the road and we need to say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do to step this forward. Here's what we're going to do to make our workforce more, you know, have more justice in the workplace. Um, and I think you help us figure that out by saying, hey, do you want to dig in on this chapter? By the way, I th you know, you could also read a chapter a week and get it all done in a quarter and do four a year. So maybe think, yeah, think go about through it four that. times. Yeah, yeah. Four times before the next one comes out. <laughs> it's a good um, point. <laughs> no, but I love that. Like, you know, you could read it or you can use it as a reference and say, okay, you know what? This month, Hey team, we're going to really sharpen up on this. We're going to really get better at interacting with the board because we got to get ready for the board That's meeting right. next month. So let's dig in on that. And you can dig into those, uh, you know, those actionable steps. Um, and I just really appreciate how you bring it to that rather than just kind of waxing poetic. So, I mean, one, one example is, uh, if I can pick up from that, Nick, or excuse me, Gio, which is uh, if you want to crowdsource an idea, how can you do that? Well, almost every corporation now has an internal Twitter function, yep. whether it's called Yammer, whether it's called Chatter, or whatever it may be called. Well, start a, a compliance uh, Jammer session yeah. uh, once a month, uh, you, you know, whether you call that uh, classroom time, office hours, or you know, meet your compliance officers. And then from there, uh, start asking questions. What would you like our code right. of conduct to be called? Right. That's exactly what Lewis Sapperman did when he was at Dun & Bradstreet and they were in the middle of an FCPA enforcement action. And uh, enough people wanted the code of conduct to be called Do the Right Thing. So they named the code of conduct Do the Right Thing. The cost to him for that Yep. Uh, title and that information was his time and his compliance team's time in chatter jams, meeting the employees literally across the world. But the employees became invested so right. much uh, in, in that. So, I mean, there are things you can do that only take your time that uh, you can do at almost no cost. So there's lots of ideas like that in the book. And again, it's so, it's so basic. It's so simple. And yet many ENC folks end up foregoing these simple hacks that your book is, you know, peppered with. Um, you know, what a way to get folks invested. You know, it's just so simple and so easy. You know, the, the title of our book, the title of our handbook came, came from you. I mean, it's just such a tangible way to show that I care about your voice. I, you know, we want to do right by you. We're trying to serve you and give you the guidance that you need. Those little hacks just have such a massive impact on you know, s repairing any sort of latent, you know, uh, ENC brand damage that has, you know, accumulated over time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a lot of that. And I think, um, you know, some of it's branding, some of it, you know, may seem like a hack because it's a small tweak that can make a big impact. But I think that there's kind of a philosophy that we're growing into as, as a profession that we're getting into some of these things that are a little messier, right? Like, it's not as buttoned up as, I read the regulations. It says we should do this. Here's the policy now. Um, and, you know, I think to do a lot of these things, to build the culture, to get in front of all the employees and, and to really be integrated. Right. You know, that's kind of a messy thing. What's going to happen? What are they going to vote for? Right. Like, OK, well, that yeah, I'm losing control of a little bit of this. But, you know, this continuous improvement, this humans as a sensor, this compliance 3.0 actual effectiveness for all employees it's going to take some of that community of That's right. I'm going to give up some of my autonomy and I'm going to share it with you and we're going to build this thing together. I think it's in some ways different from, you know, what compliance was doing 20 years ago, but it's also kind of that inclusion, that inclusivity that, hey, let, you know, let's have compliance be part of the strategic decision that we've been going after the whole time. How do you, how do you see that developing over, you know, the coming year until your next, uh, your, your next update, Tom? So when I started, uh, compliance was very much um, written by lawyers for lawyers. Dr. No from the land of no. 
Uh, and then it, then it moved to a business process where I tried to articulate, this is going to increase your, your process, business process efficiency mm -hmm. in your ROI. Uh, but I really think now, uh, Gio, I've evolved beyond that, that it's not simply uh, a business enabler, it's a part of your business process. Right. And compliance should be embedded uh, into your business process. And if we can do that through ESG, then we can drive forward not only great financial results, but uh, satisfying a wide variety of stakeholders is laid out by the Business Roundtable's statement on the purpose of a corporation and uh, kind of move the entire ball all forward. So that's super interesting that you that you kind of talked about it that way, uh, that compliance needs to be kind of integrated part of the business, not sort of over it or on it. Um, and I think there's an interesting corollary in the manufacturing world. Imagine if quality control was not part of the manufacturing process and those were separate things. Well, obviously you'd have way more quality control issues, mm -hmm. right? To the extent that quality control is influencing that manufacturing process and is there as things are coming off the line and you're sampling or, or whatever, you're going to dial in those tolerances a lot more and you're, you're going to just push out better things. So it's almost like quality control is to manufacturing what compliance is to just business in general. And as that can be integrated more, as that trust can be built with the organization, as the organization, workforce, whatever, begins to truly believe authentically that their voice matters and that the company wants to do something about it and the company wants to be the type of company that they want it to be, then you start getting a lot of that magic that does not move in a linear way. It moves in a, in a logarithmic way or a parabolic way. You can really start to get some, some, some really massive gains. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I can, you know, the analogy I use, and uh, we perhaps chided Exxon, but let me point to Exxon for this example. Exxon changed the culture of the energy industry around safety. Yep. And it was because of the Great Exxon example. Valdez. That's right. Great example. And uh, Exxon uh, changed their culture, but they changed everyone else's culture because number one, they were the leader, but number two, they demanded that from their subcontractors. That's right. And literally everyone in the energy industry now, safety became... Uh, priority number one. And, you know, every meeting opened with a safety minute and every company I was ever at or attended meetings at, and that yep. was directly as a result of Exxon. And they embedded safety into the culture, the way manufacturing uses QAQC and that other businesses such that uh, our customers, our clients are using for compliance as well. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one, th one of the many things that's so exciting about the path that we're forging here, right? We as a compliance profession is there's a lot of good that we can accomplish by doing this better, right? It's easy to kind of see the mountain of work ahead of us or we have a lot of issues to handle or we got to get this new program launched. But as we continue to make this yep. progress, whether it comes with a little bit more budget, a little bit better continuous improvement, a little fo more focus on the right impacts, how great will it be as we see just like Exxon made their entire supply chain more safety conscious if we as a compliance profession can make the entire world of, of workplaces more conscious of ethics. Yeah, right. Whether that's an, in an ESG framework or whether that's in, you know, governance, in compliance, in regulatory issues or whatever it is. But that that's what gets me, you know, really excited about the work that we're all trying to do collectively mm -hmm. is as this happens, yes, you're going to get ROI. Yes, you're going to have a better career and, you know, have a, a bigger position of respect within the organization. Yes, your business is going to be more competitive and you're going to sell better and do things the right ways, but also people are going to get treated better. Right. And uh, Tom, I think that you've contributed in so many ways in thousands of different things that you do to that progress yep. um, in this industry. And, you know, this as uh, kind of a seminal work and contribution to it um, in your handbook, I think is really just moving us to the place where I'm confident and excited to see massive transformation in how ethical workplaces are around the world because of this thing that we're all doing in compliance. Well, and it's super, it's just a very exciting time to be in this industry because there's so much like actual change going on. Right. Again, we're not talking about, you know, hundredths of tenths of percentage, you know, differences. We're talking about orders of magnitude changes. Um, we're here for it. Um, we're on the front edge of it, which is really uh, fun and exciting. And just to kind of, you know, it feels like like Lewis and Clark, like we're on this new frontier and we don't know what 10 years from now is going to look like, but we know it's going to be more light bulbs at the top on. There's going to be more leaders of organizations. There's going to be more compliance uh, representation um, on the executive level or the board level or whatever. Um, Tom, from your standpoint, like 
so I guess what I'm getting at is like this book is not a bunch of navel gazing or rehashing of like well-established principles that there's no material movement on. This is, you know, it's fresh, it's new. Uh, there's so much uh, dynamism in our industry right now. If we fast forward 10 years from now and um, more of those light bulbs are on at the top or a similar sort of uh, transition has occurred in our broad industry, uh, similar to what what we saw in terms of like safety in the energy in industry resulting from that uh, that that oil spill what do you think that catalyst is what's our you know what's Call our to arms yeah what's our valdez or whatever <laughs> uh actually i think it's going to be the pandemic because i think we had five years of changes in the in the past year yeah and i think we're getting ready to head into the roaring 20s i think we're going to have it uh financially in the investment world uh, i think there's a huge pent-up consumer demand it's going to unleash uh over the next you know, 18 months when we can start traveling again and, and do things. And I think uh, there's literally a worldwide shortage of everything. Yeah, right. Uh, front page uh, above the fold in the New York Times today talked about that. Uh, literally across the world, I think uh, the world is 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 ready for uh, COVID to to be, uh, if not beaten, at least defeated so that we can we can all move forward and it's going to create great opportunities. But it's going to create lots of new and different risks. Yeah. So as those risks appear, we have to be nimble enough to evaluate those risks. Uh, simply because something's a risk doesn't mean don't do it. It just means uh, assess the risk and manage the risk appropriately. If it's mm -hmm. high risk, put high risk management strategies around. It. Doesn't high risk typically means high dollar value return. So if you can do something and manage those risks, absolutely right. you can go for it. So uh, I think that the, the speed of what we're going to have to do is going to increase, but the nimbleness mm -hmm. of a corporate compliance function to be a part of that business process, you know, out of the world that you guys came out of so that we can, we can move more quickly. We can move for opportunities that arise more quickly. Or uh, if we take uh, COVID and the pandemic, we can respond to disruption more quickly. If the Suez Canal gets closed and we lose that shipment of fresh whatever it was, Yep. What are all, all what are all our alternatives? Yeah. Are they local? Are they Europe? Are they something else? So right. uh, to be able to to pivot and manage both opportunities and disruptions is going to be absolutely critical going forward. Yeah, and and in order to do that, the ENC Pro of tomorrow has to be a business person first. Mm -hmm. They need to speak that language of business or speak those different dialects within these different departments. Understand what those pressures are, what those dynamics. are. Are so they can better translate what needs to you know whatever is applicable from the regulation in question for that business, you know translate that into actionable terms for these people to change their behaviors appropriately, and you know just I was just kind of struck by that as you were talking through those different you know that like mosaic of examples that each one of those takes a sort of a deep understanding of like well what's the business need what is the ch the business challenge that's going on so that whatever whatever we're prescribing to the organization or to the people in it is going to lead to the nimbleness that we're going to need to continue to perform well over the next, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Um, and as we kind of get toward the end of our time here, Tom, I want to give a call to action to our listeners because I really think that everybody in the profession should have this book on their shelf. Um, and here's my case for it. We are heading into a time of continued change, accelerated reliance on compliance, uh, which means accelerated importance or risk if we don't get up to speed on it. And what I'm excited to see is compliance leaders be better equipped to go advocate to their CFO, to their CEO, to their board and right. say, listen, here's the roadmap for going forward. We don't need this in two months, but we certainly need to be here in three to five years. So I'm going to ask for a 10% increase in budget next year for these things. And then it's going to be 20% over that the next year. And then 50% over that after that, because this is what we need to build whatever, if it's an ESG framework, if it's a DOJ framework, right. if it's just a, here's how we define ethics at X company. Um, I think that everyone needs as a compliance leader, if you want to be ahead of that curve and not get caught on your heels by something like COVID, we need to lead our organizations That's into right. how to be ready for that. And I think you give us a ton of frameworks and understanding and background um, and then the steps to take action on it so these compliance leaders can build that roadmap. And I think that that's going to be the way for us to unlock the budget, the access, the data, whatever it is, is to show our teams the roadmap and say, hey, this is where we need to go over time. Um, and I think your book um, is especially well positioned to help us pick those spots where we need to strengthen and build it up. So go out and get the handbook. 
and the the ethos of the book itself again can help folks who are maybe coming from a um, a limited mindset or a limited mentality with respect to the outcome that they seem to not be able to achieve. It can reframe what's possible for them to do that internal leadership and that internal persuasion, yeah. so that there's a little bit more, um, you know, like the argument that's that's made as you're lining out your five year budgetary plan. It can be more persuasive. It can be more, you know, there's more, uh, you know, I don't know, confidence behind it, um, because you know you're 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 leading from the front. You're being proactive with respect to with respect to the direction that the program needs to go instead of to your point being on your heels and saying oh yeah we need a policy uh you know policy management solution right and i, I need that you know this year yeah. you can begin to really lay that groundwork to ascend the your department or your function to that new level mm -hmm. so uh what do you want to wrap up with tom any parting uh, words or any reactions uh, so first of all, I want to thank LexisNexis for publishing uh, my book. It's going to be available at www.lexisnexis.com backslash Fox. Cool. So uh, pretty straightforward uh, for you to order it. Um, if you buy one and you want to get it autographed, you can mail it to me and I'd be happy to autograph Very cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, uh, I'm, uh, now you guys have got me fired up for uh, the next revision all right. and where we're going to take uh, the... Uh, the compliance and ethics function literally not just next year, but maybe five years uh, yeah. down the road. So I think we've got a lot of great opportunities for all of us. I love it. Um, so if you don't follow Tom, um, get a computer and do that. Uh, follow his podcast. I mean, there's just, there's really nobody who puts out more actionable content uh, than you do, Tom. And uh, just getting to know you over the last couple of years has uh, transformed my view of this industry and the opportunity in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm it's it's just exciting to be at the, at the forefront of this um, expedition with you. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, Tom. Uh, thank you for all your contributions to this profession. Um, like, like I've said, I think the, the world is going to be a better workplace because of the work you do and the way that you empower and educate um, compliance professionals and everybody who's listening, go out there, keep doing what you're doing. I'm so proud to be part of this profession. I'm so proud to have the people around us who are working toward this and just know that there are a bunch of people uh, like Tom that want to see you succeed, that have great insights for you. And uh, you can continue to get them here on the Ethics Experts podcast, on uh, Tom's uh, Compliance Podcast Network, uh, and everywhere on LinkedIn from, uh, from this group and others. So thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. Any parting uh, words for our audience? Uh, I'd love for you to buy the handbook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can you buy the handbook, get your, uh, get your company to pay for it, whatever. But I just can't imagine a legit ENC function that doesn't have this book on its shelf. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Until next time.